um, set the scene by just giving you the overview of where we're going to go. Uh, I'm going to touch on um, cannabis use and variation in level of use and variation in level of use over time because we are longitudinal researchers. We study people's lives as they unfold. On propensity to develop psychosis, respiratory function, gum disease, cognition. Now some of this will be familiar because Wayne did a sort of magisterial overview of where the field's at and where it's got to in the last 20 years. I would like you to think about this as an opportunity to dig down into what other studies he mentioned on a, on a number of occasions in a number of these spheres, not gum disease though. Uh, this is a harbinger of where, where you might go, not gum per se, but broader health outcomes. Uh, and see uh, as an opportunity to understand how you might evaluate the quality of the evidence, because not all studies are born equal. In fact, many are very scruffy, despite strong claims that are made by the authors. So you need to have a very critical view of the research that comes out in this area. So you don't feed into the polarised and inaccurate and ultimately unhelpful debates. All right, so I encourage you to, if you're not into science or into academic papers, to try and get, develop a bit of an interest. Now, if you're reading a paper, don't read the, the stuff at the front and the back. Read the methods section first. All right, that's the most boring part, but it's the most important part. And then you'll know whether the rest is worth reading. Okay, so very quick overview of the Dunedin study. 1,037 babies born in one calendar year, 1972, April Fool's Day, through to March 30, 1973, 12 months. Uh, this grew out of a larger study of perinatal health that uh, had been going since 1968. And in the early 70s, a group of researchers said, wouldn't it be interesting to see how the babies who were born in adverse circumstances, against the background of increasingly sophisticated birth technologies that came out of the 60s, how the ones that would have probably perished in the past, how, and are now surviving, how they fare compared to their compatriots who are not born in adverse circumstances. So originally conceived of as a relatively short-term prospective study. As you can see by the slide up on the board, we've really blown that, haven't we? We're still going after 40 years. Um, the cohort the, for the longitudinal study was formed at age three. And it was made up of all those people who were still living in the greater Dunedin metropolitan area at age three who were approached and agreed to participate. Now, 1,139 were approached and 91% said, sure will enrol. We think, in fact, the early work, and Rob McGee's here, he was involved very early in the study, uh, the early work shows that those that didn't say yes didn't really differ meaningfully in terms of perinatal characteristics and other demographic factors from those that said no. So we think we've got a pretty good snapshot of a generation from that part of the world. We followed them up repeatedly as they've aged 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 18, 21, 26, 32, and most recently at age 38. Uh, what you'll see on the right-hand side, I'll just draw your attention to, is that we've been pretty successful at keeping people involved. Uh, we often get credit for that as researchers, uh, and certainly we work very hard uh, to find uh, uh, and recruit back in uh, to the particular assessment all our study members. But ultimately it's not us that deserve uh, recognition as the study members themselves. These are the people that fly back from wherever they are in the world and put up with us asking for a full eight and a half hour day, a thousand different questions and poking and prodding and measuring everything under the sun. So it's credit to them and their desire to help others because they don't really get much out of this. Um, you, a free trip back from the UK at 21 was a curse, I admit it. But who's done that lately cattle class? No one's done that cattle, you're all smart. I mean, because if you did it cattle class, it would kill you. It is a nightmare. So there's no perks anymore. Uh, they get 100 bucks to cover the, so that's about $2.07 an hour, um, just to cover, just to recognize that they make a time commitment. Uh, so this is important also from a science perspective. Most studies, and this won't surprise you to know, most studies of this type, where they follow people through time, suffer from um, a, a relatively high rates of attrition. In other words, the number they start with tends to whittle away because it's hard to find people over time. People move around. And once you've found them, they're too busy or they're not interested in participating. So um, that can introduce bias. And this is because the people who drift away first, 
and are hardest to find are not a random group. It'd be marvellous if they were, because you just start with a huge number and let it wind down over time. But these are people within whom multiple problems aggregate. These are the people that smoke a lot of dope, that use other drugs, that are in and out of institutions, that don't have a fixed abode, they don't have a cell phone. They may be in the Northern Territory running from the law. Sorry, Wayne, do you pick on Australia? Um, so these are the people that are most often lost uh, to studies like ours, but we manage, and as I say, it's, we do some hard work, but it's the goodwill of the study members. We managed to keep virtually the full cohort intact after 40 years. Now that gives us faith, scientific faith, that's not an oxymoron, scientific faith in the breadth of exposures and the breadth of outcomes that this general population sample can talk to. Often when I put this up, particularly overseas, people are a little aghast uh, at the numbers because it's not meant to be possible. Don't worry about the detail, it's just the map of where people were at, at age 38. So a quarter live outside New Zealand. 17% live on the West Island, over here. Um, it's not a bad thing, actually, if you're a cricket fan at the moment. Um, so you can imagine the logistics of finding people and getting them all back. And, we, and this is a very earthy research project. I mean, we've had people who've rung up from Singapore from the bar and said, um, uh, I lost my passport, <laughs> and are en route. And so we have to respond there and then with how does one find a passport that uh, a person who's obviously inebriated has lost somewhere in between London and Singapore. Uh, so uh, all credit to all the players over the years. Rob, and there's, there's hundreds of researchers that have been involved in various ways uh, for them and what they've done, because what I'm going to be producing, uh, talking about today is what many people have worked hard to create by, by virtue of the data set, because the science on top of it's not that clever, if you ask me. Again, we get plaudits, but most of everything I'm going to talk about stems from real life observation or common sense, given the data we have. So everything depends upon the quality of the data. Um, very quickly, uh, it's a multidisciplinary study, so we'd study all sorts of stuff. Um, if you're talking about cannabis and health, that matters because what it means is that when you find an association between cannabis and X as your outcome, people might say, well, that's not because there's a real association, but because of some third factor or other variable that's driving that result. And when we've got a very broad database, we can often control, not for everything, nothing's perfect, but we can control for many things that others can't. You see, by the way, over here, potential in the, at the physical health end of the spectrum. If you're interested in various health outcomes associated with um, uh, exposure at high levels over many, many years, you can start to investigate those uh, outcomes. And I would also say, uh, picking up on something Wayne said this morning, that one of the, if I had to boil down the 1,100 odd publications that have come out into a single sentence, is that things emerge much earlier than you think. So everything that you think happens at 60 probably is happening now in our mob, the late 30s, COPD signs, for example. So if you follow people up into the early part of midlife, you can start to get a handle on how the rest of midlife and beyond may pan out. I, I wasn't clever enough to get this, this, this picture, but I like it, so I, I use it a lot. That enigmatic smile, people have wondered what it meant. Well. This clicker doesn't work very well. Okay, so cannabis use and psychosis. Now I've just thrown out some references. Um, don't worry about them. You'll have the access to the to the talk after the uh, conference, and I'll also give to Ross uh, and his team all the papers that I mentioned, so you'll be able to get PDFs of those. So um, I picked on a, a few to illustrate certain points, bearing in mind the the real life nature of what we do and and the earthiness of it. Um, the first paper led by Lou Arsenault from IOP now um, came at a time at that, yeah, came at a time literally when two other papers were in the same edition, but there was interest in the issue from academics. So uh, in the space of about a year it was, I think, Dave Ferguson, uh, three papers in BMJ, and then uh, Jim Van Oss had done a paper. And so all of a sudden you went from a sort of reasonably controversial um, s situation to one where some good longitudinal studies all seemed to converge on the same point. 
which was there seemed to be an elevated risk of developing psychosis, psychotic symptoms or a disorder related to psychosis in the presence of cannabis, uh, particularly when it was used during the adolescent years. Now, for me, where this interest came uh, from was uh, something I'd done at the beginning of 2001 in the New South Wales courts where I was asked to be an expert witness in an awful uh, trial uh, where a, um, a man had put a claw hammer into his girlfriend's head when she was doing some work at, at night in their flat and they were in a good relationship, had been in a stable relationship for five years. And the, uh, the Crown said that this was as a result of cannabis-induced psychosis. And I was asked by the other side to come, come across and evaluate the evidence and to say, now this guy was on a psychotic trajectory because there are early emerging signs and predictors and risk factors that are known about, and we've helped contribute to that area of interest. Uh, because if, he was, if it was cannabis-induced psychosis, he was in a slammer for a long time. He was culpable. If it was part of a disease process that had been going for a long period of time, he was going to be put in hospital and get treatment. Uh, so this kind of pricked my interest. Uh, you know, this, is a, this matters in, in, you know, in unusual areas, a court of law. And I saw the havoc wreaked by this act by this person on both sides of the family. Uh, so this is where it came from, at least from my point of view. Uh, in short, what we found was um, an increased odds of developing a schizophreniform disorder. And we used tougher or higher threshold criteria than the standard criteria that they apply in DSM-4, uh, simply because we're in an epidemiological sampling frame and people doubt the validity of our diagnoses, and that's fair enough, I would too. So we raised the bar in terms of number of uh, positive symptoms and, and so forth. We used informant reports, we used data obtained on the day in terms of how the study member looked and, and created a, uh, a schizophreniform disorder diagnosis. And you can see if you started using cannabis by the age of 15, uh, there was a significantly elevated risk, four and a half times. Um, nothing by 18, nothing to speak of. Uh, if you, and we were unusual, and, and I think we remain unusual in this sense, although there are younger studies coming through with this data now, um, we took that association and said, what say we control for um, symptoms of psychosis before they start using cannabis? In other words, at age 11. Uh, we were unusual simply because Jesse Anderson, a psych child psychiatrist at age 11, got hold of a brand spanking new DSM-3, and got the structured diagnostic interview that went with it way back in the early 80s, asked the kids all the questions of the, in the common disorders, depression, anxiety, but she was also a sensitive quality clinician and thought, I'm gonna ask them about some of these psychotic symptoms. Because up until that point, people thought it was a waste of time. Kids don't have psychosis. If they do have these symptoms, they're not real, they're just child fantasy type stuff and they have no prognostic value. Well, God bless Jessie, because she got the data and it, that allowed us to control for psychotic symptoms, which might drive self-medication. That's the self-medication idea. All right? And what you see is the, um, the relationship, whilst it remained high, it was because of our low numbers, uh, it went non-significant. That's at a disorder level. It was still significant, though, at a symptom level. So what would you, how would you interpret it? You say, well, you know, you can't say unequivocally, um, even when you could, especially when you control for uh, uh, pre-existing psychotic symptoms at a young age, predating cannabis use. Um, but there does seem to be something there. Okay, an important point at this stage was to say, does this predict other things? Is it something to do specifically to do with uh, schizophrenia or symptoms of psychosis? Um, and what you see, certainly at 15, is there was no effect. But as Wayne alluded to this morning, people are now beginning to look a little bit further than psychosis. And you actually, you see buried, two, uh, this is 11 years old, this data, since publication, you see an effect here for depression. Interesting. But it's at 18, it's at an older age. Um, and what about other drugs? You know, amphetamines and, and the like. Uh, well, there was no effect whatsoever when we uh, threw in other drugs. So, what have we got? We've got... People that used cannabis by at, um, starting at age 18 and beyond uh, had a slightly elevated risk above the population um, prevalence. Our, our psychosis measure is broader than schizophrenia, so it was about 
people have often questioned that, uh, but uh, we've done some attrition analyses and showed that the easiest 80% um, that we get in actually have rates closer to the, to the expected norm, and the last 20% we get in tend to be, uh, there tends, tends to be a disproportionate number of people from suffering from psychosis, so that's maybe why we end up at that end, end of the range. The, the main effect that people took out of this uh, is the lower circle. Now what you should see when you see that, if you had an odds ratio of three to four, and you could you know, mount a campaign based on that, what you see though is 90% of those that smoked cannabis by age 15 did not progress to a diagnosis of schizophrenic form disorder. What that tells you immediately too is that you've got heterogeneity in response. In other words, a whole lot of people are exposed to something. Some people go on to develop a problem, many don't. And at that time, we were doing what are called gene environment studies, where we're trying to understand this heterogeneity in response. So we did something on uh, the cycle of violence. That is, why do some people who are maltreated grow up to maltreat others? Others do not. Then we did one on life stress. Why do some people who have lots of life stress become depressed? Others do not. Uh, and so we did the same thing here. We said, why is it that some people who have smoked a lot of dope during adolescence end up as psychotic and others do not? And we were reasoning that maybe it's to do with individual differences in genetic makeup. So we looked for a gene that in theory should be related to schizophrenia or psychosis. Uh, and the gene that we hit on was the COMP gene, C-O-M-T, catechol methyl transferase gene. So when we're des designing our study in the 1,000 people, we come up with an environment, that's the E bit, the environment in this case is exposure to cannabis during adolescence, because we saw the adolescent effect from the first study, remember? Uh, and then we uh, had our gene, and we wanted to relate these two things together and see whether it predicted the likelihood of ending up with a diagnosis of psychosis. Now, genes, a very quick primer on genes. Genes come in various forms. Um, we all have a gene that says make two eyes. You just have one version of that. All right, that's why we've all got two eyes. Um, we've also got genes that are called polymorphic genes, which means, as a fancy word for saying, it comes in multiple forms. And these are natural variations. And it's because you get one part from your mum and one part from your dad. And they kind of, like cards, shuffle together and come out. And they might come out with um, two, what they call, um, uh, uh, homozygous, homozygous um, uh, that means two the same, in this case val val or met met, these are fancy names for the genotypes, or you get a heterozygote, one of each from uh, mum and dad. If you're looking at the general population, 25% have this val val version, which theory in animal studies suggests should place you at risk in the context of exposure to cannabis. 50% have one of each and 25% um, have the other version. What do we find? Well, yes, early onset uh, cannabis use uh, was related to uh, adult psychosis, but it seemed to depend on which version of this gene you had. The risk was, as you can see, just eyeballing the, uh, the slide here. If you had the, the homozygote met or the heterozygote, the rates of, this is the percentage of people with a diagnosis of psychosis at 26, weren't massively elevated. There was something going on here, but then if you look at this 25% of the population with this genotype, which had also had adolescent cannabis use by adolescents, then their risk was uh, significantly increased. In fact, that's the odds ratio. So almost 11-fold difference in terms of likelihood of developing schizophrenic form disorder by mid-20s if you had used cannabis versus not having been exposed to cannabis in mid-adolescence. Okay, so that's the main results. That's what a table looks like. And so you see no effect of genotype. So just knowing the gene by itself didn't tell us anything about people's likely trajectory. We saw a, an environment effect. You'd expect that from the first paper. But you also saw this interaction. Now that's using cannabis exposure at 15. Interestingly, when it's above 18, it disappears. Right? There's no longer an effect. Well, what are you thinking at this point? You're thinking, well, maybe there's something special to do with that period of age 15 and or thereabouts uh, about what's happening in the brain, possibly. Maybe it's particularly sensitive to the effects of uh, substances like cannabis. Uh, 
Uh, but before we went down that path in terms of theorizing, we had to rule out some alternatives, and we can do that because we've got lots of data. So we asked, um, did this uh, essential relationship from age 15 apply to the later ages? No. Uh, was it uh, a function of other substance use, known to cause psychotic symptoms? No. We threw in uh, psychotic uh, symptoms at 11? No. IQ, low IQ or problems with cognition precede development of schizophrenia? That wasn't the explanation. Nor was conduct disorder, which tends to antedate development of schizophrenia and psychosis. So you can see this is the basic relationship here. And that's the uh, beta value. And you put all these other factors that might explain into the model, and things don't move around a lot. So it looked pretty, I don't say robust, but it looked real enough, uh, given that we were, at this point, trying to make it go away, believe it or not. Um, we had a couple of successes in the gene environment area, and we were attracting a bit of attention. Not all of it was good. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure we were on firm ground with this. Uh, um, so... What did we take away from this study? Well, we haven't identified a major risk factor. You know, the group of people that are saying, look, you know, if cannabis really was causal. Everyone's using more of it these days. Why aren't the rates of schizophrenia uh, going through the roof? You wouldn't expect it. You got 25% in terms of genetic vulnerability. Then you got 25% potentially in uh, using adolescence, uh, using cannabis in adolescence. If you cross tab those, you're getting down to very small numbers. And as you saw, the rates of schizophrenia form disorder were not huge. That's 12% or, uh, or 15%. Uh, even when you take into account, actually it's a little higher. It was almost one in five. But still, it's not a major risk factor. Um, it made us think that adolescence is a particularly interesting period in terms of brain development. And we went looking through the literature. Nadia's work from the 90s was quite you know, um, trailblazing in that regard. Uh, and it did seem to make sense, both in terms of animal models but also human models, that the adolescent period could be a period of peak vulnerability. And so the take-home from this is a very moderate message, and that's what I would come down to time and time again, is that probably right now, given the limited state of knowledge, all you want to do is tell your adolescents to eschew cannabis use until they're older. Now, it's a pretty state, but it's supported by the, uh, by the research evidence. Uh, it's not alarmist. And actually, adolescents get this. Uh, I've got a 13-year-old girl, um, and she's beginning to talk about these sorts of things. And sh she asked me about it, and I told her, and she went to school thinking that uh, her friends would react um, negatively and you know, tell her that her dad was a dick kind of thing. That's the sort of language they use, or she uses towards me anyway <laughs> these days. Um, and she was very surprised, because they all went, well, that's interesting. Oh, maybe we should try and put it off. Um, so... That's the message that we took out of that at that point. Um, around this time, and Wayne has already talked about this too, there was a, a bunch of studies that were saying that there may be some adverse effects of using cannabis. Um, and they tended to be dose response, as Wayne pointed out this morning. So the more you use, the more likely bad outcomes were. So there was interest in the mental health area at this time. All right? So you've got interest in both the states. Big issue there, very conservative government at that point. So the real, the real agenda was sort of anti. Um, and in Britain, they were reviewing sort of uh, uh, the legislation, I think, at that point. So this type of information fed into it. So whilst that's happening, we're going in a different direction. We're thinking, well, what about... And I'd read the burden of disease stuff years before when I was working with Gavin Andrews. And I thought, you know, these models are very useful. They appear in every grant application you ever read. It says, my thing has a high burden, uh, da, 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 da. But they're as good as the data that you put into the models, and they're as good as the assumptions that you make in terms of coming out with, you know, building your algorithms. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, okay, all they think that cannabis is, um, does is really might cause some uh, psychotic problems um, in a minority of people. So I bet you the estimates are quite low. And sure enough, they were. And they remain low. I mean, the latest um, project... Uh, has uh, really confined itself to those negative sequelae. Uh, and if that's the case, then it is low. So it probably makes sense, doesn't it, to think that, hey, Wayne's foreshadowed this, that if you smoke stuff and you smoke a lot of it, it might have a negative impact upon your lungs. So the first study looked at cannabis dependence at age 21. All right, so they haven't been smoking for very long. And we just concentrated on, because getting the right, you know, measuring dose is hard with cannabis. 
I mean, you can ask how many times, but every time someone sits down, uh, they might have very, you know, different amount from someone else sitting in the same room even, right? So it's a real problem, but you've got to work with what you've got. So we just thought we'd focus on dependence. Uh, and we found uh, that uh, there was increased rates of a number of respiratory symptoms. Uh, so wheezing when you didn't have a cold, uh, uh, being short of breath when you exercise, uh, being woken up at night by a tightness in the chest, and finally having too much sputum production in the morning. It's the <laughs> in the bathroom, the first thing in the morning. Uh, so these were the problems that were happening at a very early age. So we thought we'd follow this up uh, in the next study and work with Dave, uh, Dave Ferguson and uh, applied a fixed, reg uh, fixed regression model uh, to the data at 18, 21, 26 and showed that once you set the cannabis exposure data up, as a continuous variable from low to high, from none to high, um, and uh, look at the relationship between that and various uh, measures of lung function, uh, your ability basically to move uh, air in and out of your lungs efficiently was our main variable, adjusting for lung size, uh, that you had an association between the amount of cannabis you'd smoked over that eight year period and the likelihood of having poor lung function. However, if you controlled for um, certain factors, uh, such as tobacco, uh, it's an obvious thing to control for because of the high rates of coincident use, uh, but also age and height and weight, that that effect went, became marginal. It went to 0 0.08, right? So there seemed to be something there, and I think Wayne was talking about this, it's, it, it's there, it's not, it's not clear. You can't take this to the bank yet. Uh, so we did the next follow-up at age 32. Is it there? Yeah, it is. Um, and found that, did the same thing again, basically, and found that uh, but had better measures of lung function. So we had this body plasmograph, which people sit in, temperature, I mean, temp pressure controlled. You have to do all these lung maneuvers, and the data gets fed off into um, a computer, and you can produce all this stuff about gas transfer and um, uh, stuff I don't even understand, because I mean, I'm not a respiratory physician, I'm a behavioral scientist. Um, but we had this uh, respiratory physician, Bob Hancock's, um, in the team, and so he was able to look at this and found that there are negative effects of cannabis, but they're different from tobacco, it appears. The effects that you mainly see are to do with hyperinflation. So lungs are bigger after you control for normal growth rates. And there seems to be some sort of resistance with large airways that comes with cannabis use. Whereas airflow and gas transfer problems are more common among tobacco smokers. And when you think about method of use, <laughs> big holding, hold or holding for longer, and it starts to you know, um, make sense, but I, would, I wouldn't take much from this other than to say it's an area right for further, more in-depth research, because there may not be always the same type of negative outcomes, but that doesn't negate the possibility of there being other forms of negative outcomes. So I think this, the jury's out on this area, and it would um, benefit from further, further work, and we're following up at age 38 as we speak. Uh, so that's lungs. Um, what about gums? Now, most people I know don't find gums very interesting. Teeth. My mate Murray, he's a, he's a public health dentist, thinks the world has got it all wrong. But I can actually understand why most people don't think gums are overly interesting or, or caries or whatever. However, in a study like ours, if you want to get a good measure of physical health, they're fantastic, the whole, uh, oral health indicators, because they're easy to measure. I mean, he comes across from the dental school and actually looks into our people's mouths and he calls out numbers that only make sense to a dental researcher, uh, to his assistant, and he's got an immaculate history uh, from late teens right through to 38 on the state of these people's mouths. I reckon it's the canary in the coal mine, the oral cavity, because uh, I just see the study members when they walk in and they smile at me and I can say, well, you know, it was six years since we last saw you, but you've probably aged 16. Uh, and we're going to do some work on that idea. But suffice to say here that uh, there's a lot of untapped areas in terms of health outcomes you may want to look at in the context of uh, trying to map the waterfront when it comes to understanding the true impact of uh, using high amounts over long periods. That's the theme, that's the takeaway. High amounts over long periods of cannabis. Uh, now, tobacco is the major behavioral risk factor for gum disease. Gum disease basically is 
when the bone in which your teeth sit starts to rot away because of, of infection in the gums. So just think of your, the bones that hold your teeth um, being infected, and it's just like a, um, a pool of poison, if you will, and it just starts to rot away the bone. And it's not very nice when your teeth fall out. It doesn't look good. It's not great for getting jobs, uh, not great for quality of life. Uh, very bad for systemic inf uh, uh, infection and inf inflammation, which of course is a risk, uh, risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So this is a, um, a serious issue. Smoking tobacco causes um, uh, gum disease because basically it interferes with the, the natural restorative process. So because the mouth's a dirty place, uh, it get, there are infections coming and going all the time. And the ability to respond, the immune system to respond and overcome re infection is compromised by tobacco because of all the crap in it, all right? And we asked, this is why it wasn't you know, very clever, we just said, what about, you know, we've done respiratory, what about gums? Uh, and so Murray went off and um, did just that, and um, I put this here, because JAMA is an American, uh, is, is a, uh, a medical journal from America, and it was, they had a special um, thing on gums at the back to teach uh, general um, medical people, general physicians about gum disease. It was the first paper that had appeared in JAMA for 20 years, we were told. It, it, anything to do with the oral cavity, uh, which strikes me as being a little kind of um, out, of, out of whack with the importance of the oral cavity, as I, as I alluded to earlier. Anyway, uh, cannabis um, smoking, at least, uh, results in the ingestion of a whole lot of bad stuff, as does tobacco. Um, tobacco use and cannabis use often co-occur, so one of the problems is you have to control for the effects of tobacco uh, if you're trying to distill the effects of cannabis on bad gums. Um, we had good prospective measures of both tobacco use, so we're asking our people every time we see them as they're growing up, how much have you used, and usually we cobble it together in terms of the last 12 months. We don't go for longer periods because we know there's a real decay in accuracy of reporting much past 12 months. So we stick to these sort of episodic 12-month blocks every time we see our people. So it's not entirely accurate, but we think it's within the confines or constraints of our design, it's probably the best way to go. We have the same thing for cannabis. We, are, we created artificial groups. I mean, there's no, nothing set in stone or nothing, there's no gold standard. We just said, what's it look like in terms of your gum health if you used a lot of cannabis, so we used the top 20% in, in terms of amount, over those years 15 through to 32. Um, some, and that's less than 40 times a year. That's the per annum rate, all right? And then more than 40 times a year. Those are our three groups, and then of course we've got um, smokers as a control. What do we see? Uh, don't worry too much about this. This is, um, this is about the average rate of gum disease at 32. This is m females, that's males. Now, if you're from low socioeconomic background, um, you have much higher rates. That's expected. If you're an um, episodic visitor of the dentist, instead of a routine uh, visitor, your rates are higher. If you use a lot of cannabis, your rates are much higher. The blue and the red bars just refer to prevalence and incident, inc incidence rates. All right, so in terms of first pass of the data, there did seem to be an association. And that's what it looks like when you adjust for other known confounders. There's a threefold increase, if you're in the top group, of having clinically relevant levels of CAL, combined attachment loss. That's the term they use for gum disease. It drops down a bit to two and a half times, and this is after adjusting for these other factors, known to influence or affect or relate to either the exposure or the outcome. This effect remain the same. We did a sensitivity analysis, whether it was 10%, 25%, or the top 20%. So it wasn't sensitive to that particular cut we used. Um, and you know, we've got to check those sort of things. It could be an artifact of where you decide to draw the line. When we uh, just confined our analysis to those using cannabis versus those who had never smoked anything, so clean of tobacco, so it's not a, just a statistical control, um, you see the odds ratio in a similar space, slightly bigger. I wouldn't get too excited about that. This is the social context in which this debate has evolved over 100 years. I just want to remind you of that. So gums are uh, at risk if you use lots of cannabis. 
the next thing we have done uh, was to ask the question, as Wayne uh, alluded to this morning, uh, others have looked at, Nadia has done work, uh, and, and many others um, have attempted to do this. Does using a lot of cannabis over time result in impact upon cognition? Uh, the main problem with the previous research is that they, they didn't get a measure of cognition before people started using cannabis. In other words, it may be certain types of people um, who are prone to using lots of cannabis also have a different um, profile in terms of their cognition from the outset. Now, why is this important? You've heard this before, but it bears re repeating. The last point, uh, young ones these days, um, when asked, tend to think there's very little harm uh, associated with cannabis. Uh, despite the three talking heads on Seven Sharp, uh, the young ones themselves, oh, not a big deal. And so rates are increasing and starting probably a little younger than ever before. Okay, so IQ testing, four waves of IQ combined into one, right? So we even got the artifact of someone having a bad cold on one day, having a depressed result. We've got th four waves, uh, seven through 13. Then we've got 18, 21, 26, 32, and 38 measures of cannabis exposure, and then measurement of IQ at 38 again. Not just IQ, by the way, a whole bunch of other neuropsych tests, but I'll just talk about the IQ data today. Um, sorry about this being so busy, but I'll just draw your attention to a couple of things. On the left-hand side, we you can see how we've used our, out, um, our exposure variable. We've used a dependence measure and then multiple episodes at which dependence was uh, present. Not at all. Have never used. Have used but never given a cannabis dependence diagnosis. One diagnosis between 18 and 38. Two diagnoses and three diagnoses. Then we just look at use. They don't correlate perfectly, so it's a, another way of confirming the general pattern. Nothing ever used right down to um, having used regularly for three or more of those five waves between 18 and 38. What you see here is in, in effect sizes, you can actually see the IQ scores. So the mean is about 100. All right, and you can see um, before can in childhood IQ here, all right, if you take the bottom one here, on both, three diagnoses. It was 100 in childhood and it's dropped to 94. Right, that's an effect size of 0.38. An effect size of 0.3 is small, 0.5 is medium, 0.8 is large. Right, so there's an effect there across the whole population that's statistically significant. In terms of size, it's not huge, but it seems to be non-trivial, worthy of note. And the same pattern, same effect size almost, here. Right, so that's just when we, we take people that and the child would measure their IQ. Then take 20 years of cannabis use of varying levels, ranging from none to a lot over that 20 year period and measure their IQ again. And you can see the people that started early, well, I'll get to this in a second, but the ones that start early and use a lot over time have the greatest decline in IQ. Uh, in very simple terms, here you have on the left hand side, the people that started using in adolescence and the gr light gray is those that started using as adults, equating for the number of phases or assessments at which they had a diagnosis. So that's been made even. It's not just about the sheer time of, um, of exposure and therefore opportunity to be have a diagnosis. So you equate for that. You see a strong effect here. All right, that's three or more. Um, this is a drop in IQ points. This is 0.55. That, Wayne talked about an effect of eight IQ points lost. He thought it was about 1%, it's probably more like 3% in this sample, this analytic sample. That's a non-trivial number of people that are losing over half a standard deviation in terms of IQ. After controlling for a whole bunch of things. This is the recovery picture. In other words, we have here in the uh, dark bar those people that had used um, first at adolescence and then had essentially stopped using by the time they were 38 in the year before. All right, that's their IQ there. Um, and the difference between, where are we? Uh, this one and that is uh, significant and between this one and that. These are child and adult. In other words, people that started using in, in childhood, uh, sorry, adolescence, um, who used um, over time but had stopped using did not recover all their IQ. If you look at the same picture for those who started using adulthood, you see essentially the same IQ. 
All right, so this may be permanent, maybe. What's the take home? Uh, importantly, um, there does seem to be an effect, and it's robust to a lot of um, uh, adjustments. So we adjusted for recent cannabis use. We adjusted for uh, chronic depression. Uh, we adjusted for other drugs. We adjusted for schizophrenia. And this relationship remained robust. Finally, we were criticised um, by a couple of people that said, oh, it's all down to socioeconomic uh, status differences or you haven't, it's all down to a, a personality trait called conscientiousness or, or the self-control. Um, suffice to say that we did a lot of analyses subsequent to this to show that that was not the case at all. So it's robust to those um, suggestions as well. Take home. Dose response relations have policy implications. So when I talk about dose response, I'm not just talking about the amount of cannabis you use, but it's the amount of time you're using it as well. So the more you use and the, more, the longer you use it, the worse the outcomes. If you use, let's put this in perspective, and there needs to be some pragmatic approach to dealing with the policy implications here. You can't not have a, a view on this if you're doing research in this area. You can't say, well, we don't know for sure because we haven't controlled for every, every confounder under the sun. Then you never say anything about anything. Right, so on the weight of evidence, one can say safely today, I believe, 2013, is that there are some risks, and they're across multiple domains or physi physiological systems. Uh, they tend to accrue within the minority of the population, depending on uh, vulnerability by genotype. Most people, though, if they use a little bit now and again, are pretty immune from negative health effects. Um, the burden of disease stuff I mentioned earlier, uh, before I rush off down the path of saying most people it's fine and therefore you've got a small group need some, you know, because immediately you get into targeting, um, I think probably the overall burden has been underestimated because, well, the WHO just look at psychiatric out outcomes. They don't look at all the other physical things. Um, and this is a statement of your thing. I've been saying this for years. Um, and it's so good to be now um, behind the game. Uh, you're racing ahead of what we've been saying as researchers. It's a health issue. Uh, I believe Dave Ferguson will come up with some interesting comments about how you may deal with a legal um, context of society currently and how that can get in the way of doing certain things. And he might even have some suggestions about uh, a way forward. So I'll leave that to him. I won't steal his thunder. Thank you very much for listening and have a nice conference. <laughs>